I'm Edward October, and this is A Nefarious Nightmare. This podcast contains foul language and discussions of violence. Additional trigger warnings will be posted as needed in the show notes. Listener discretion is advised. And then every time that we started to go back to that restaurant for lunch, more times than not, Corey always seemed to be at the bar drinking when uh, we were ordering lunch. Looking back on that now, that that was in the middle of the day, that was a red flag. Um, after he killed Katie, he continued to frequent that same bar, and he drive past our house, coming from that bar in the same damn truck that he killed Katie in. Um, still had the dent in the hood from where Katie's head hit, from where her body wrapped around his truck. Drove that truck up to the bar and continued to drink and drive. And from what I've been told, he hasn't changed. I don't think he's capable of changing. On April 21st, 2020, as the pandemic was just starting to ramp up, Katie Palmer wanted to go for a walk with her husband for the first time. And this was her first time with her husband to go out and enjoy the fresh air and spend time as a loving couple. She has been described by many as jovial and had a laugh that was contagious. A beautiful smile that felt like sunshine and a presence equally as warm and accepting. But the smile would be forever burned in everyone's memory as her life was stolen from her soulmate and her two children by a man who shouldn't have been driving. With that, I'm Amanda Cronin. And I'm Courtney Fenner. And a nefarious nightmare presents He Drove Blind Down a Road. Justice for Katie Palmer. case of too much ego, too much bias. I don't know about you all, but if my kid were involved in an auto accident and passed away as a result, I'd fight tooth and nail to get justice for her. And at the same time, if my kid were involved in an auto accident and she was the one that killed another person, I'd still fight tooth and nail for justice for the victim, being that the victim is the person that died at the hands of my own flesh and blood. But why? Well, I'm glad you asked, because... If it were my child or my spouse, I'd want the same respect. I'd also not take advantage of the fact that I'd have close ties with law enforcement. If I did, because in order to obtain justice, bias would need to be left at the door. We all are on the same side here, where we want a fair trial and justice for those innocent people who died at the hands of another. It's why we all continue to make these episodes and have survivors and victims tell their stories. We will be the thorn in the side of those offenders who think they got away with it. Do you all remember Courtney Heater? What about Alex Van Dalsen or Brianna Nugent Nix? What about all of the victims of the serial rapists that we've discussed at length? I sure hope you remember all of them because they all have something in common with the survivor that we will hear from today. They all were failed by a system that shows favoritism by way of quote-unquote knowing the right people. Whether their aunt, uncle, dad, cousin, friend, the offenders in these cases all have that in common. They have ties to law enforcement who can't help but volunteer their time in the background to create intimidation to victims and their surviving family members. We aren't intimidated though. In order to obtain justice, the truth needs to be spoken. We will gladly give our platform to those who are wanting the truth to be heard. And for those who are wanting to seek the truth, after all, the truth, by all accounts, will truly set you free. Sure, you can live all your life stuffing skeletons in your closet, not ever letting them see the light of day. But let's be real here. You'd end up being imprisoned by your own guilt and the red letter L patched to your person, L, for being liable, losing, liar. The following is a clip from a TikTok account, Justice for Katie Palmer. Take a moment to hear her voice, resonate with her voice, get to know her based off of her voice because 
The way we want to remember her is by how kind and compassionate she was. Hey guys, I've missed y'all so much. And I miss joking around and just having a good time in class. So um, I have an idea that maybe this week for our office hours on Wednesday, I will attach a link below. And for our one o'clock meeting, um, I would like for you guys to bring your pets with you. And let's zoom and uh, see everybody's pets. Um, I have six pets at the house. So um, I know you guys are missing Honey and Winnie. And um, I can introduce you to my other four animals as well. So uh, click on the link underneath the video in Schoology and let's all get together on Wednesday. According to tellrobert.com, reckless driving causes 33% of all deaths involving major car accidents, which are more than 13,000 each year. 30% of auto accidents are credited to the speed of reckless drivers. 40% of all car accident deaths are attributed to driving under the influence. Distracted driving causes about 20% of car accident injuries. Reckless driving, also called aggressive driving, is a very conscious act. These accidents are a direct result of negligence. Reckless behaviors include speeding, failure to yield the right of way, running through stoplights, tailgating, racing, and erratic driving, driving under the influence of alcohol or drugs, as well as texting or talking on a cell phone are also examples of reckless driving. Reckless driving accidents in most cases are a result of a number of traffic violations in which the driver displays complete disregard for on-the-road signals, signs, and laws. The most common ones are tailgating or simply driving way too close to the car in front of you, completely ignoring red lights and stop signs, sudden braking, forgetting to signal while changing lanes or turning, driving while under the influence of drugs or alcohol, talking on the phone, texting, or performing any other distracting action while driving, failing to use headlights at night or in other sight-obscuring cases, and making illegal turns or lane changes. Statistics also show that drunk driving, according to bankrate.com, one alcohol-related death occurs every 52 minutes in the U.S., According to the NHTSA, drunk driving accidents are responsible for 10,000 deaths every year and about one third of all traffic related deaths, according to the NHTSA. In a recent year, more than 230 children were killed in drunk driving crashes, the NHTSA reports. Drinking and driving costs more than 44 billion in deaths and damages annually, and at the end of 2020, 26.8% of drivers that were killed or seriously injured in a crash had alcohol in their bloodstream, according to the NHTSA. The consequences of driving under the influence are severe. A first offense DUI can cost $10,000 or more in fines and legal fees. In 2020, the number of fatal accidents involving alcohol was up 9% compared to 2019, even though drivers traveled 13% fewer miles overall. Drunk driving accidents are statistically most likely to occur during the months of June, July, and August, according to the NHTSA. About 68% of alcohol-related fatalities happen at night, and 28% happen during the daytime, based on NHTSA data. A driver is considered legally impaired when their blood alcohol concentration, or BAC, measures 0.08 or higher. The number of drinks it takes to reach this BAC largely depends on gender and weight, but the average is two to three drinks of standard pours for adults. Please keep all of this in mind when listening to this episode. Before we continue, here is John Palmer, the loving husband of Katie Palmer. My name is John Palmer. Katie Palmer, she was my wife. Katie was killed on April 21st, 2020, roughly two tenths of a mile away from my house on Glenwood Drive in Denison, Texas. This happened on the street that we live on. Katie was exceptional. Katie was outstanding, plain and simple. She was beautiful, both inside and out. Katie was brilliant. She loved science and nature. In fact, she taught middle school and even brought a STEM program into her school. She was a loving mother that adored her two kids, Bella and Brandon. Every decision she made, she kept both Bella and Brandon in mind. 
She told me many times that her most important job was being a mother. Family to Katie was important. Her best friend was her mom, and she spoke to her dad on the phone almost every day. Uh, she loved and was loved by her brothers and sisters, aunts and uncles, cousins and friends. She was my soulmate. I loved her with all my heart, and I will never stop. We all terribly miss her. The man that killed my wife is Corey Todd Foster. Corey had no aliases. I was introduced to Corey while I was at lunch one day. Um, one of my business partners and I would go eat at a local restaurant that had TVs in the bar area, and we go order a sandwich and a Coke and watch TV while we ate. A neighbor of mine called Corey over from the bar and introduced him to me. And then every time that we started to go back to that restaurant for lunch, more times than not, Corey always seemed to be at the bar drinking when uh, we were ordering lunch. Looking back on that now, that that was in the middle of the day. That was a red flag. Um, after he killed Katie, he continued to frequent that same bar. And he drive past our house, coming from that bar in the same damn truck that he killed Katie in. Um, still had the dent in the hood from where Katie's head hit, from where her body wrapped around his truck, drove that truck up to the bar, and continued to drink and drive. And from what I've been told, he hasn't changed. I don't think he's capable of changing. This man that killed my wife um, has seemed to go on about with his life and has seemed to continue his reckless behavior. He, he was almost, I think mean, he was in his late 40s, and he had this reputation. Um, I, I know this now, rep reputation of um, just being drunk and having absolutely no accountability for any of his actions. None. Um, you know, the choices he made that day resulted in the death of Katie Palmer, resulted in my family changing forever, resulted in a tremendous loss for this community. A tremendous loss. From what I've been told, he hasn't changed. He still continues this reckless behavior um, that resulted in the death of my wife, Katie Palmer. After Katie was killed on social media, we found pictures of Corey Foster, Tarif Alkatib, and their wives together at parties on Halloween and Christmas, months before Katie was killed. Both wives worked together as hairdressers, and I believe that Tarif Alkatib and Corey Foster um, and their families had a close relationship. The DA who failed to get an indictment in this case represented the Foster family in a DWI before he became the elected DA. Um, in this one instance, Corey Foster's wife was driving the car and she was convicted of a DWI and Foster was a passenger in this car and he was charged with public intoxication. Dist District Attorney Brett Smith never disclosed this to us. On April 21st, 2020, I woke up, I went to go work out in the backyard, um, and after my workout, I was going to go walk down our road, and the night before, Katie had asked me to wake her up so she could go walking with me. Katie never went walking or running with me in the morning, um, so I didn't really think it was going to be a possibility that she would actually go. Unfortunately, uh, when I woke her up, after reminding her that she asked me to wake her up so she'd go walk with me. Um, she decided to walk with me for the first time ever. So we left our house on Glenwood Drive after we told our son, Brandon, that we were going for a walk. Brandon, most of the time, would have come with us, would sometimes get up with me and go walk and run. But um, this was at the height of COVID or when COVID was starting and um, he didn't have to log in that day for school until later, much like Katie, who didn't have to log in to go teach her students until later. So Brandon went back to sleep. <clears throat> we didn't wake Bella up. Bella's our daughter. Bella was a late sleeper, so we thought we'd be back before she would wake up. So Katie and I started down our road, Glenwood Drive, heading west. We would usually go walk on an old golf course that was by our house because there were paved pathways, but um, there was some dew on the ground and she was going to go back to sleep when she got home, so she didn't want to get her legs wet. So we decided to keep walking alongside the road, and she told me that there were some killdeer 
that were nesting on some undeveloped lots. And um, if you don't know what killdeer are, they are birds that nest on the ground. Uh, she was a biology major in college. <clears throat> That's where we met. And she studied ornithology and she loved killdeer. So we made it to these undeveloped lots, which were just about directly right across the street from Corey Foster's house. And we looked, didn't see any killdeer. So we turned around and now we're walking east on Glenwood Drive, heading back to our house, facing traffic. We were walking on the correct side of the road. And um, when we were roughly about two tenths of a mile away from our house, that's when Corey Foster crossed over the roadway and hit us both from behind. Corey hit us so hard that he knocked us out of our shoes and sent us approximately 70 feet into the grass, into the golf course area. <clears throat> as soon as I hit the ground and stopped rolling, I knew that we had been hit. Um, I couldn't get up. I was on my hands and knees, and I looked over, and Katie was propped up on her left elbow, and she was looking in my direction, but she was looking over me, and she let out this moan, this painful moan, I couldn't get up. I couldn't get up and walk over to my wife or run over to my wife. I felt like I had a ratchet around my torso that was tightening. And at that time, Corey Foster acknowledged us and said, oh my God, I didn't know it was you, John. He identified me by name, said that he couldn't see. He was trying to clear off his windshield. I'm crawling over to my wife and yelling for somebody to call the cops, to call the police. Um, all I could think about was her. I got over to her, I laid her down on her back, and I noticed that she wasn't breathing. I was begging for her to breathe. While I was doing that, a neighbor had pulled up and had come running over to Katie and was sitting down next to where Katie's head was. And um, she was also asking Katie to breathe and she was such a calming voice. Katie finally let out a gasp for air and I thought everything was going to be okay. I thought she's she's breathing. Um, her breaths were shallow gasps for air about every 10 to 15 seconds. And that's when I noticed that she wasn't blinking and that her eyes were fixed and she was staring straight. I, I begged for her to blink. I begged for her not to leave me, not to leave the kids. I begged for her just to blink. Um, at that time, we heard the fire trucks and the ambulance they got there within 10 minutes. Firefighters and the EMTs immediately started working on Katie. They asked me if I had been hit. I said, yes, I had. I, I couldn't stand up or couldn't get up. Um, I heard them talking about getting the helicopter in to evac her out. Um, I was loaded up into a gurney. I was put into the back of an ambulance. Katie was care flighted to a trauma center in Plano. I was driven to the ICU in Denison, Texas. That's the last time I saw Katie that day. Um, when I was at the ICU, I got a call from a family member, and they told me that Katie wasn't going to make it. Um, my kids were at that hospital without me saying goodbye to their mom, and I couldn't be there with them on their, on their worst day. I couldn't be there for them. And um, my bones healed, my wounds healed. But the pain from that day never will heal. Never. DPS failed on April 21st, 2020. Tarif Al-Khatib should have never been the officer in charge of this investigation. And by investigation, I'm going to throw that up in quotes because there was, there was not an investigation done that day. When Tarif Al-Khatib showed up on scene, he noted that Corey Foster smelled strongly of alcohol. Tarif was probably five feet from Corey and made that statement multiple times. Asked him how much he had to drink, asked him when he stopped drinking, and the story changed three or four times. Tarif al administered some field sobriety tests on Corey Foster. Um, he started with a simple walk and turn test in which Corey Foster did not seem very steady on his feet. He then had Corey Foster perform a horizontal gaze test to where Again, this was not even shown. His Foster's eyes weren't shown on the body camera footage. 
but Al-Khatib stated that uh, Foster had zero clues on the horizontal gaze test. That's going to be important here in a second. And then Foster performed a one-legged stand to which he could not hold his foot out the full 30 seconds. He was shaking uncontrollably and fell down onto his other leg, the one that he was holding up, and started laughing. And was just saying that his work boots were uneven. Laughing. Laughing while my wife is being loaded into a helicopter. Um, laughing while I was being driven to the ICU. Laughing while my kids are finding out that both of their parents had just gotten hit by a truck. And um, they're, it's ridiculous. Um, so after Foster completed these field sobriety tests, Tarif al decided to give him a portable breathalyzer test, to which... Corey Foster blew a .06 50 minutes after killing Katie Palmer. 50 minutes after. What was his BAC an hour before when he ran us over? Sure wasn't at a .06. Now, going back to the field sobriety test where he did the horizontal gaze test, al stated that Foster had zero clues. Zero clues of intoxication during the horizontal gaze test. Anything that you read online would tell you that that is impossible. That having a .06, he would have to have at least two to three clues on the horizontal gaze test. And that's a test that Corey Foster could not cheat on because it's involuntary eye movement. I believe Tarif al lied. <clears throat> I believe that he lied to cover for his friend. He did not even show the PBT score in his body cam. So we're taking this trooper at his word that he blew a .06. We're taking him at his word that he had zero clues, which is impossible, on the horizontal gaze test. On scene that day, when al was talking with another trooper, another trooper asked al with certainty, we're getting blood, right? We're going to go get a blood test. And al response was no. All this was from last night. All this referring to the alcohol that was still in Corey Foster's system. The alcohol that contributed to uh, the cognitive impairment that Corey Foster suffered while driving down the road blindly to his own admission uh, because his windshield was fogged up and because he was on his cell phone. Um, Tarif al declined to get a blood test from Foster that day and instead loaded up Corey Foster along with his two loaded handguns that he kept in his truck and drove him home instead of to the hospital for a blood test. Because that's what friends do, right? That's what that's what Al Kati did for his buddy. Drove him home instead of driving him to the hospital, like every other law enforcement officer would have. But Al Kati falls into that point zero zero one percent, and instead of doing the right thing, he did Corey Foster a solid and took him home after killing my wife. I would hear from Al Kati a day or two later, and um, I asked him if he got blood, and he said no. And he said it was a good thing that he didn't because that blood test probably would have come back at a point zero four or a point zero three, and that's what we would be stuck with. I did not know, because I obviously haven't had any run-ins with the law, um, that a portable breathalyzer test is not admissible in court. In a criminal court, a PBT test is not admissible, but a blood test is. So he told me that that point zero six is what we'd have to go on in court instead of a point zero three because time would have elapsed and the body would have metabolized some of the and um I was naive and I didn't know and I thanked him I would later come to find out that uh, that's just another misstep that Tarif al made that day another misstep such as not marking the scene at all not marking where our bodies were not marking where the truck stopped not talking to neighbors on scene, not speaking with a neighbor that stopped to help Katie and I after we had gotten hit, not the neighbor across the street that heard the collision and could have told him exactly where Corey's truck was. al also failed to take adequate pictures that day. Our family had to supply the district attorney's office with pictures of the scene that were taken by Katie's aunt one day later because al did not do an investigation and did not do his job. I called Brett Smith, our district attorney, weeks later, and asked about the status 
of our case about if charges were going to be filed. Brett had not gotten the report yet. So he told me that I probably knew more than he did about what was going on and that uh, as soon as they have any information and uh, as soon as they received the file that they would be in contact. Fair enough. More time had passed. Weeks had gone by. Rhonda Nail, Katie's mom, called Brett Smith. She couldn't get him at the DA's office, so she got his number off of Facebook. He had his number on Facebook. He had his number on social media. It's public. She called him, not knowing it was a cell phone, and he answered. She asked about the status of the case involving her daughter's death. And instead of getting a district attorney that said that he was sorry for her loss, instead of a district attorney stating that he was going to do everything that he could to make sure that there would be justice, he got angry with Rhonda for calling him on his cell phone, told her that he knew nothing about the case, didn't know Katie's name at all, which contradicts what he told me, and went on to tell Rhonda that she should never call an elected official on their cell phone and to never do it again. That was our introduction to who Brett Smith really was. Well, as soon as this happened, one can only imagine what would be going through a mother's head after she just got dressed down by the one person who could bring justice for her daughter's death. So Rhonda, this community, our friends and family, were angry. We don't have a platform. So we took to social media and Rhonda told of her interaction with Brett and there was an outrage, as rightly so. So a week or so later, I get a call from our district attorney, Brett Smith, and instead of him telling me that he's got the case and uh, again, he's going to ensure that Katie gets justice, he gets angry about what's being said about him on social media. Our elected DA calls me a victim and a widower and lectures me about social media. He then does that again. He was more worried about his public image than he was about doing his job and still acts that way to this day. So June of 2020, we have a meeting with Brett Smith and two other prosecutors, Katie's mom, Rhonda, Katie's dad, Tony, Katie's brother, Logan, and I met with District Attorney Brett Smith, and again, two of the prosecutors. I started off the meeting by wanting to introduce them to Katie. Katie was not there at the meeting. This meeting was going to be about Katie. They didn't know Katie. I brought pictures, and I wanted to explain to them who she was. The other two prosecutors in the room took the pictures and looked at them. And Brett Smith, who wasn't sitting at the conference table, but instead was leaning up against the wall with his arms crossed, refused to look at any of the pictures. Um, Very smugly told me that he'd seen everything he needed to see on social media. Well, I told him that I was going to continue, and I introduced them to Katie. As soon as it was Brett's turn to talk, he looked again at Rhonda and was very angry about social media. Again, (laughs) third time, not sorry for your loss, not we're here to help you, not we're here to get justice. Um but angry about how he was perceived on social media. And when he was done with lecturing us, again, a victim in a victim's family, he looked at Rhonda and told her to call off her jihad against him. The meeting ended with Brad stating that they were going to look into the case and assign a prosecutor. Um, We didn't leave with a good feeling, but at least we got our meeting, right? Um... Terry Ashmore was a prosecutor that was assigned to this case. I met with Kerry Ashmore two or three times to go over what had happened. Um, Kerry Ashmore eventually brought this in front of the grand jury on August 19th, 2020. <sighs> Kerry and um, another prosecutor, Nathan Young, presented this case to a grand jury. In Texas, a grand jury consists of 12. That day we had 10. One grand juror was sick and didn't show up. Another grand juror recused him or herself, and we were left with 10. And in Texas, you need nine. You need nine people to uh, agree that this case should move forward. Tarif Al-Khatib testified. 
DPS did not do a, a crash uh, reconstruction to this, so Grayson County had a third party that did a crash reconstruction. Uh, that expert testified, and then I was allowed to testify as well. <clears throat> After three hours, Carrie Ashmore came and told me that the grand jury declined to move forward. I would later find out that the third party was not complete with their final report that was dated six days after the grand jury. That report is damning. That report alone should have or would have um, definitely led that grand jury to an indictment. Also, days after uh, that Sunday, after the grand jury, the first grand jury, um, Carrie Ashmore and Nathan Young threw a party at Carrie Ashmore's house. Carrie Ashmore's wife, Kelly Ashmore, is the district clerk. The district clerk controls the jury. At this party, Carrie Ashmore, Nathan Young, and Kelly Ashmore had an impaneled grand juror at this party where they were drinking beer, playing volleyball, and eating burgers. That, um, that infuriated me. That right there lets you know that there is no impartiality in Grayson County at all when prosecutors and grand jurors can um, can be around each other like, like that. When you're a grand juror, when you're a prosecutor, you're supposed to be impartial. That does not, does not represent impartiality at all. Absolutely biased. Um, so Carrie Ashmore failed. The district clerk failed by not having 12 grand jurors there. Um, Carrie Ashmore failed to get an indictment. Carrie Ashmore failed to properly uh, ensure that he had all of the evidence at hand. Uh, for instance, that third party report that was dated six days after the grand jury, that wasn't presented to, to the grand jury. And also through civil discovery, because there is a civil lawsuit going on um, against my family, Corey Foster, we got Corey Foster's cell phone records, which Brett Smith and Carrie Ashmore on numerous occasions both told me that they would get the cell phone records and review them. They never did. They never presented those to the first grand jury. We got these records roughly 18 months after Katie had been killed. And these records clearly indicate that Corey Foster was dialing a number as he crossed over the roadway and hit Katie and I. We put a timeline together. We sent this over to the DA's office. And I asked him why hadn't they got these records? And they would never answer me. Um, they said it was my fault. Said it was my fault that, that they didn't subpoena the records that um, we had put too much pressure on them to move forward uh, with the grand jury, which is absolutely insane. Um, <laughs> I'm not a lawyer. I don't know. Uh, this was evidence that could have been used in the first grand jury, um, but never was even requested. It would have never been requested if it wasn't for our civil attorney who got these records. We presented them to DA's office. They looked at them and said they would review them. And then um, I get a phone call from Carrie Ashmore at 4.30 one day, I believe it was a Monday, and um, he told me that they were going to take these records in front of the grand jury, they were going to take the cell phone records in front of the grand jury and present those to the grand jury, and if the grand jury had any questions, they would give them any other evidence that they requested, and he was just going to see what the grand jury thought if they wanted to move forward. I asked him if I needed to be there. He told me no. We're going to provide them with the cell phone records. And then um, if they have any uh, other questions, we'll, we'll go from there. And our phone call ended pretty abruptly. And I sat there and I thought, this doesn't seem right. Why would he be calling me at 4.30 p.m. to tell me that this grand jury is going to take place the next morning? Why am I not allowed to be there? Why wasn't I going to be able to give my testimony again? I called back up to his office. He wouldn't take my call. I had his uh, cell phone. I sent him a text message. He said he couldn't talk, um, <laughs> couldn't talk as uh, later come to find out that he was at an election party. Uh, couldn't talk, but could text briefly. And so I asked him what was going to be presented. And he told me that, again, it was just going to be the cell phone records and what he told me during our conversation. And, and that's it. And I requested that he hold off until I was allowed to testify because this was a brand new grand jury. This is not the first grand jury. There had been multiple grand juries after the one that heard this the first time. Um, I want this case to be presented again with this new evidence. I, I don't want an abridged version of what happened. 
I want you to show them everything that the first grand jury didn't see, including this new evidence. Um, I want Al Khatib to testify again. I want that third party report that was never presented to the first grand jury. I want that presented. I want to be able to testify in front of the grand jury because I was a witness and a victim. And I want them to see the, the body camera footage. Didn't respond. I, um, I called up there at 6 a.m. that next morning. Um, left a message for Dis District Attorney Brett Smith and told him that Rhonda Nail, who's Katie's mom, and I would be there. And um, we want to talk to him before they present anything to the grand jury. Um, we got there a little bit before eight, saw the grand jurors file, filing in. We asked to speak to Brett. They said that they'd get the message to him. Next thing we know, Carrie Ashmore comes um, walking out of the grand jury room and says, well, it's in the grand jury's hands now. And when we started to question him, why wouldn't you guys call us? Why wouldn't you let us testify? Um, he told us that he didn't have to explain him, himself and um, he was damn good at his job and he stormed off. And then Carrie Ashmore came back about 30 minutes later and said, the, the grand jury has declined to move forward um, based off of this new evidence. I can't tell you how angry I was, but <clears throat> I think everybody in that building that was around us um, knew. I unloaded on Kerry Ashmore that day and meant every single word that I told him. And I believe everybody in that building heard everything I had to say. That's the second time that office has failed our family. They did two half-assed grand juries. They provided half the evidence to one grand jury and then provided only half of the new evidence to the second grand jury. They failed us twice. There is no way that a man who admittedly drove blind down a road, told troopers he couldn't see when he left his mailbox, he drove three-tenths of a mile blind with his windshield fogged over, said he shouldn't have been driving, said he, he shouldn't have drove, said he, said he should have nev never left. He drove blind for three-tenths of a mile with the strong presence of alcohol on his breath and in his body. He was on a cell phone, not looking at the road crossed over the roadway and hit two pedestrians that were walking alongside the road and killed one and sent one to the ICU. That right there, those five or six sentences I just said, that right there should have been enough to have a grand jury say, there's enough here and we believe that this should move forward. Um, the Grayson County District Attorney's Office did not want to prosecute this, this case. And... <clears throat> It is um, infuriating that our family is still here over two years later, still fighting the same district attorney, still fighting the same inept prosecutor, Carrie Ashmore, to get justice for my wife, Katie Palmer. Still fighting. I saw Brett back this April. A week or two after um, he had talked to Katie's mom, Rhonda Nail, on the phone, um, <laughs> we had requested that Brett call us after that last grand jury, left messages with his assistant and finally got back to Rhonda, oh, four months later, four or five months later. Had the audacity to um, mispronounce her name multiple times, kept on calling her Rhonda Nall. Um, doing it on, on purpose. Um, stated that he didn't really know about the case, didn't know the particulars. This is not a large county. This has been on the news multiple times. Brett Smith knows who I am. Brett Smith knows who Rhonda is. Brett Smith has acknowledged Rhonda in public. Um, after he did this, <clears throat> after he purposely mispronounced her name, purposely antagonized Rhonda by saying that he knew nothing about her case, I ran into Brett at the Justice Center and um, I stopped him. And looked him in the face and told him that uh, what his office did was wrong and what he was doing was, was wrong. And um, he told me that uh, he wasn't the man that I thought he was, in which I very much disagreed with him and uh, told him that um, he is exactly who I think he is. <clears throat> he told me he was a Christian man. I told him to then act like it. He told me that wasn't fair. He tells me that statement wasn't fair. That, that angered me even more that he would even say that that statement that I made to him was unfair. Un, unfair is going, <laughs> unfair is seeing the man that killed my wife 
drive up and down our street multiple times a day, still with a dent in his hood to where my wife's head hit. Un- unfair is walking with my son down that road and him looking at where my wife was hit and uh, him getting emotional and telling me, you guys were so close. You guys were so close from being home. That's not fair. Not fair is having is, is being a child and being woken up to somebody telling you that your mother and father are probably dead. How do you how do you get back from 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 that? Our our lives changed that day because of nothing that we did, but because of the reckless choices Corey Foster made. His reckless choices resulted in the death of Katie Palmer. But yet we are burdened with injustice because of the actions of a few people. The 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 few people that can actually change this won't change it. That's unfair. That is unfair. This injustice remains unfair. I would label this as negligence that caused the death of Katie Palmer, where Corey's recklessness and the cognitive impairment he had with the alcohol in his system, as well as the distraction he had with the cell phone in his hand, as well as the visibility issues that he had, uh, all contributed to the death of Katie Palmer. Katie was a rock. Katie was her glue. You know, I went for a walk that morning with my wife, and she never came back. My kids woke up to their grandmother, telling them that both of their parents had been hit by a truck, and she didn't know if we were alive or dead. I still wake up sometimes thinking that she's next to me in bed. Um, We will always have a hole in our heart. Always. What happened here in Grayson County, Texas, can happen where you live. Katie could have been your mother, your wife, your daughter, your sister, your cousin, or your friend. We will continue to fight for her as long as it takes uh, for us to get her justice and for there to be change here in Grayson County. We'll fight for as long as Corey Foster remains on our roads, for as long as Brett Smith is the district attorney in Grayson County, and for as long as Tarif al continues to wear a DPS badge and work in Grayson County. You won't stop. She deserves better. Katie deserves justice. Our, our goal has always been justice for Katie and change where change is needed. Um, we heard about a family, the Carney family, who lost their son to a vehicle pedestrian accident. And um, we worked with them and lobbied with them to get House Bill 558 passed. Uh, it's known as Colton's Law. The spirit of that law would require that any motorist that hits a pedestrian and causes either serious bodily injury or death be tested for uh, drugs or alcohol. Their blood would be drawn, unlike what happened with Colton Carney and what happened with Katie Palmer. We want positive change. We want change here in Grayson County, and we want change in the state. Um, We also want her story to be told. We want to continue to shed light on the injustice that we've been fighting. And surely there has to be somebody out there that hears this, that hears all the podcasts that we've done and can help us bring justice to Katie. This week, again, we are meeting with Texas Department of Public Safety. We're meeting with the chief of the Highway Patrol to discuss the actions of Corporal Tarif al and to find out why they refused to hold al accountable for covering for Foster back in April of 2020. I want DPS to tell me, Katie's mom and dad, why they continue to circle their wagons around him and protect him. We have state senators, state representatives, other law enforcement officers, our district attorney, and even the Texas Criminal Defense Lawyers Association um, that have stated that al did a horrible job that day. Uh, He made missteps, he quote, messed up, and have even been told um, that he should be fired. Everyone sees this, again, from state representatives to state senators to Texas Criminal Defense Lawyers Association. Everybody sees what has happened. Why can't DPS? And so when we meet with them this Thursday, again, um, we're going to be able to ask that question. Why? Why do you fail to see this? Why do you continue to go along with this? Why is there no accountability? Why? On April 21st, 2020, John Palmer and his two children lost a wife and a mother. Her parents lost a daughter. 
but their killer is still walking free and the Palmer family has been failed by the system because of obvious favoritism. There's nothing that the family can really do since they do not have the privilege of knowing quote unquote the higher ups intimately. But what can we do? We can advocate on their behalf. We can listen. We can raise awareness in our magic phrase, apply pressure. If you would like more information on justice for Katie Palmer, you can visit facebook.com slash justice for Katie Palmer. We will include it in our show notes. To me, and not to interject my own opinion, but the fact that these people are adamant about public image and fighting for the offender rather than the victim, who is Katie Palmer, by the way, this all just screams guilt to me, but what do I know? I feel like we should have more strict laws against drunk driving and any distracted driving. People take way too much advantage of how relaxed people have become, but enforcing these laws, yes, these laws, could save more lives and prevent more accidents and deaths from occurring. So to the DA, the DPS, and law enforcement, we are calling for action. Please reopen the case and assign new people who have zero conflict of interest or bias in this case. And to those who are sweeping this under the rug, let's hold them accountable. And please do not ever drink and drive. If you do, you very well could steal the life of an innocent person and you would steal the livelihood of an innocent family. Before we wrap up, let's get some house cleaning out of the way. We have revamped our Patreon, finally. We have tiers that start at $3, and the highest tier is just 10 All proceeds from Patreon go directly back into our podcast, but we have lofty goals. We want to get to a point where we can donate back to a worthwhile cause focused on victims of sexual assault. Also, don't forget that we have the Dallas True Crime Podcast Festival August 26th through 28th. Tickets are going fast, so hit up truecrimepodcastfestival.com and get your tickets. That way we can meet you and hug your neck. And we'll also have all these fucking stickers that we've got to give out. So come meet us and get, get a sticker or 50. Katie Palmer, John Palmer, their two children, their entire family, their friends, anyone who has experienced this loss, they are bees. And remember, be vigilant for when you mess with the bees... You get the hive. Thank you for listening to A Nefarious Nightmare. Original intro music by Ghost Stories Incorporated. Remixed by Ryan RCX Murphy. Additional music provided by epidemic sound this podcast was researched scripted and produced by amanda cronin and courtney finner a nefarious nightmare is a cloud 10 i heart podcast managed by a nefarious nightmare sim sarna and jamie rice of murderish and dirty money moves thank you again for listening and be vigilant